in order to invoke that God is, there's only one way of doing it. And I have yet to have any believer challenge me. We have to appeal to God's revelation of his of himself. Because if we don't appeal to God's revelation of himself, then there is no way to invoke and instantiate God. Can I ask you to go over something? Sure. Okay. Uh, obviously, you said a lot that um, I'd like to go over, but I, I know we're probably both time limited. Um, could you go over a little bit more about why or the problem with brute facts? I don't think I entirely follow the issue. The issue they're, meaning, they're meaningless. Okay. In order to understand why a brute fact is meaningless, you have to understand it in context of the world that it negates. Okay, so what is the opposite or, or uh, converse of a brute fact? It would be a created fact, okay? So even something like the Eiffel Tower will, or let's say some star or, or anything else for that matter, okay? Either it will be a created fact or not. Now, a created fact doesn't mean that, like, for example, the Eiffel Tower God did not create the Eiffel Tower, but God did create the creation and all of its parameters and the material out of which the Eiffel Tower was reformulated by human activity, including the mind and reason and talents of those people that uh, made the Eiffel Tower. Now, if that's not accepted, then... There's only other, one other way to char characterize that, and that it is a brute fact. It simply exists without any ultimate foundational reason as to why it is. And therefore, I don't, it, yeah, go ahead. Oh, well, I was going to say, and I don't mean this at all as a, a you know, to be offensive or anything. Um, no, you listen, you talk on eggshells. I don't. The only people I give a hard time are people who are trolls or liars. So don't worry about it. You're you're not on today's. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I'm sorry about my mic yesterday. I'm on my um, phone this time. It seems to be no. It's good. Better. It's good. Okay. Good. Um, I was going to ask you: Wouldn't the existence of God be a brute fact under your worldview, or not? No, because a brute fact has no explanation what whatsoever either independently of itself or internally to itself, okay? So God is not a brute fact. God uh, is self-contained. Self God requires no external, yeah, God, God is, in, in biblical theology, God possesses a theity, which means he's non-dependent. He's simply okay. self-contained upon himself. He necessarily exists without derivation. But brute facts, on the other hand, if, if somebody said that, um, let, let's say they, they said a black cube, right, was a brute fact, right? Okay. Well, that would be different if they said, well, the cube itself is self-contained, uh, absolute, and eternal. To be absolute would mean that you're unconditionally non-dependent, non-derivational. Okay? okay. And so, therefore claiming that something possesses a saity would would mean that it wasn't a brute fact. A brute fact is something that simply exists without any reason, both externally or internally, as to why it exists. It just is. Could it not be the case that the universe has just always existed in some form or another reality? I know universe is kind of a loaded, a loaded term because that could mean different things. Um, so I mean kind of the, the the cosmos, you know, planets and stars and, you know, some form of matter no. and energy has always been here and it just changes form. No? No. No. No, because what is fundamental and absolute is not a contingent state. It's not It's not what we would consider probabilistic or possible. What it, what it means is, is that if I tell you it's possible there's a deer in my backyard, well, okay. whether the deer is in my backyard or not, it's because it's of contingencies around it. The deer in question is contingent. Uh, God, on the other hand, 
uh, is not contingent. So when people try to reason probabilistically about God, this is a major fail. I was uh, having an interchange with a famous atheist philosopher a couple of days ago. He went from saying he was a strong atheist to then uh, trying to backpedal furiously that uh, it's, God is highly unlikely. Okay. Now, okay. If, if, if we say that, if somebody says, well, God probably exists, then we're not talking about God. God, in order to be God, will have to be a God that necessarily exists, period. He cannot not exist. So um, all facts from a Christian worldview are created facts. But if that is rejected, then all we're going to have a, a, left is an array of particulars or putative facts for which there cannot be uh, any relatedness or connectedness that can be instantiated, and that there's no fundamental reason why anything is what it is. Now, when unbelievers hear this, they think that's ridiculous, and the reason why is because they're ripping off the Christian worldview, okay? And, and part of the reason why they're doing that is because God has ordained that we think in a certain way at a fundamental level about his creation, but they don't want to acknowledge God. But the moment they try to surgically remove God, they're ripping off the Christian worldview. Now, if they claim they're not, then they're going to have to step up the plate and tell, tell us that when they assert any state of affairs or fact, why that is. So here, to give you an example, do you know who Lawrence Krauss is? Uh, physicist, right? And yeah, a he's a, he's a, yeah. yeah, he's a firebrand foaming at the mouth atheist, and he's always ranting um, that we don't need God. We don't need to appeal to supernatural woo-woo. We can explain everything through the laws of nature. Krauss says we don't need God. We can explain everything through the laws of nature. Well, I called his bluff. I said, Dr. Krauss, what is it that is fundamental, absolute, and ultimate, the source of all possibility? His answer was, I don't know. And then he realized that he had gotten trapped. And he goes, and why does that even matter? Well, it matters because you said you could explain everything through the laws of nature. Right? Now, if you, if you can't identify what is ultimate, what is the source of all possibility and impossibility, then you are bluffing when you say the laws of nature can explain everything. And you can't even defend that there are laws of nature. They may, you may devoutly believe there are laws of nature. Right? Right. So, so, so for, for example, um, although it's contrary to the way people think, we could live in a world, a universe, that is so gargantuanly large that it is it's simply inconceivable to us. So, for example, that the visible universe that we now hold to, which is unimaginably large. Okay. Right. Right. The visible universe, what if it was by analogy as small as what we consider a subatomic particle as it is to the visible universe? Yeah, you ever and seen so, Men in Black? Where you got that in the marbles? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what I'm saying to you is imagine our universe is comparatively sized to a subatomic particle to the size of the visible universe. Sure. Right? And that the universe is just un- – inconceivably large well then then you could have certain coincidences and consistencies that are not imposed and secured where whereby certain mental states of of entities conceive of it that way so the point the point is simply this the unbeliever simply takes for granted certain foundational beliefs and parameters that they believe simply exist without the need or reference to God. So the question is, do these states of affairs exist given their model of reality? I'm not questioning the reality or the actuality of the uniformity of nature. What I am questioning is the uniformity of nature can only exist in one model of reality that's true. And if it's, if, if the uniformity of nature is not attributed to the God of the Bible, then in which metaphysical context does the uniformity of nature exist, and is it real? 
it makes no difference that somebody is just like utterly shocked and dumbfounded that I'm, I'm questioning the reality of the uniformity of nature given their model of reality. And this type of approach drives atheists and unbelievers crazy because we're, we're now calling into question their most cherished fundamental beliefs that they think are so, such a given that it's simply um, perverse. Subversive. Even, perverse and subversive to call into question the reality and actuality of these things within the context of their metaphysic or worldview. We're questioning their Bible. Yeah. So, so the point is, from an atheistic or an, uh, even an agnostic unbeliever standpoint, there's nowhere to turn. The Christian worldview, the God of the Bible and his property set, is the only coherent worldview to hold to. Not that it's the best, it's the only one to hold to. And we can show the various properties and attributes of the God of the Bible, why those are necessary for human reason and intelligibility. Now, if somebody calls into question the God of the Bible for whatever reason, say, fine, okay? You believe that your reasoning calling into question the God of the Bible is valid, so I'll take your word in it. Then we're gonna examine your world of from whence that reasoning comes, but that cannot pass the smell test. You know, a child would have to be sitting on the father's lap in order to slap him in the face. And in order to attempt to deny or refute the God of the Bible or the existence of God, you would have to either consciously or unconsciously presuppose that God as creator instituted a world that operates in regular ways in order to uh, have the capacity to reason and then to affirm or deny anything. Here's, here's another line of reasoning, okay? If, it, if you doubt anything at all, if you doubt any state of affairs, then God exists, okay? Now, I'm sure atheists will hear this and laugh their rear ends off, but here's the problem. You know, the reason why doubting is only meaningful in God's world is because God is that which is ultimate, absolute, creator and imposes and sustains what is, can be, and cannot be, so that certain states of affairs cannot be, or that they are improbable. They're off limits to consider. They're so far-fetched, they're so improbable, that it's off limits. But if we reject God's self-disclosure of himself in creation, then where does one turn to ground that anything is off limits. Unbelievers say all the time, oh, you believe in magic. You believe in miracles. No, you're the one who believes in magic because in your way, at least magic would be something, right? In their worldview, there is nothing identifiably or attestably that will make anything impossible, okay? So if you even doubt that you have enough money to, to fill your gas tank up in your wallet, then God exists. Do you doubt anything? Because you see, in a world without God, there's nothing identifiably foundationally or all in an ultimate sense to restrict anything from happening. You're going to have to believe at a conscious or an unconscious level that something is happening absolute, unconditionally absolute, and immutable, that in turn imposes regularity. Because if you don't, then the regularity of this world is indefensible. That's one thing I've heard you, um, a word I've heard you use a couple of different times, impose. Could you elaborate on what you mean when you say impose? Do you mean yeah, like the reason why I'm like saying that? Will? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly comparing and contrasting what people say and think with respect to what God has revealed, right? And any, anybody can do this, that you don't have to have special training, okay? So in the Christian worldview, the Christian worldview is very simple and basic, but it can also be very sophisticated. 
In the Christian worldview, God is that which is eternal. He is I am that I am. He is the only thing that is self-contained, non-dependent, absolute, ultimate. Okay? Um, I, I lost my train. I thought that, what was your question? Uh, I was asking about how you're using the word impose. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, good. I had a Joe Biden moment. All right. So <laughs> in the Christian worldview, we have the creator-creature distinction. There's God and then his creation. Now, even if an unbeliever doesn't accept that as true, it's important for them to understand that because then if they understand it, they can have a much clearer understanding of what they do believe compared to what they don't believe. So they do not believe in the creator-creature distinction. In the creator-creature distinction, it is God who institutes all particularity. God is the one who institutes and imposes the regularity amongst irregularity. It is God who institutes, imposes, and sustains unity among diversity. Okay? Now, if somebody says, we don't need God, say, okay, fine. Is there actual unity among diversity? And is it imposed or is it an illusion? Is it real or is it fiction? The regularity that people presuppose, is it real or not? And people think it's perverse. They think it's subversive to ask that question. But guess what? It's not subversive. It's perfectly legitimate. But they, they think it's subversive because now it puts them in a monumental bad situation. They can no longer spew out their atheist slogans, catchphrases, and uh, platitudes. They just won't work. Okay. Mm. Now, to show you a quick example of it, I interacted with the doctor, Professor Stephen Law. He's written several books as a philosopher. He's widely popular as a philosopher. And within less than 15 minutes, he started acting like a snot-nosed teenager when questioned about his atheism. Because in spite of the fact that he's a highly educated man, right, and he has that academic achievement, his reasoning is just as foolish as a, as a snot-nosed teenager before God. And he could not answer the questions. And guess what? He thought I was being subversive, but I wasn't. I was just asking him to legitimize his position, but he didn't want to do it. Right? They tried to move the goalpost. He tried to change the subject. He tried to impugn me. And then finally, the people who were running the AMA parachuted in and said, get down, Mr. President. And they rescued him by booting me from the room. Is that the that Canadian was, Catholic guy? I think I saw, uh, I'm not positive if I saw that yeah, one, but yeah. I think I saw yeah, well, one. They, 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 keep, they, keep on, they keep on doing it. You see, and the, the secret sauce is this. The wisdom and revelation of God cannot be refuted even by the wisest of the wise on this planet. It can't. The, the, Do you think proof, the proof of Jesus Christ identity claims is the identity claims themselves. Okay? And people say, that's circular. Yeah, that's right. And that's what we would expect from the creator. Because the creator could not appeal to anything independent of himself. And when we look at the internal content of Jesus' identity, identity claims about his properties and attributes, that the denial of his self-identity claims as creator and Lord and Savior will result in a person speaking and reasoning from a worldview that is a bottomless pit. There's nothing to it. It cannot be defended. There's no rhyme or reason why anything is happening. Do you think so, that you could... Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, do you think that um, you could come to the same conclusions that you've drawn without 
I guess, having read the Bible beforehand or knowing about Christianity a little bit beforehand? Or do you think, do you, do you think that this is something that any person could, you know, reason through for themselves, even without knowing about Christianity? Uh, we, can, we can reason through God's revelation. In fact, there have been unbelievers who have come to the realization, like, for example, um, metaphysics can be divided up into the nature of being, ontology, ethics, and epistemology. All three of those things are going to depend upon God. Like, for example, in... Uh, Doichevsky's book, The Brothers Karamazov, they reasoned, and I'm paraphrasing, if God does not exist, then anything is permissible. I've read Nothing Crime and Punishment, but not that one. Yeah, yeah. So, so the, po the point is, is we have to understand the way God represents himself in Scripture, not as unbelievers want to conceive him. They want to conceive of God as, you know, the people's... They want to conceive that, that God simply coexists with a world that just is. But you see, that's not God, right? They want to think of God as just simply, simply being, they already believe in the independence of facts from God. And when Christians come along and they say, well, God made everything, their attitude is, uh, I don't believe that. Well, you know, the, the world can be just explained just as it is. But the answer is it can't. Because without God being himself as being eternal and being what is the metaphysical absolute, instituting and securing the regularity in this world and the unity among diversity and endowing us to recognize this and to be like himself, then human consciousness doesn't actually exist in a not God world. This is why unbelievers get very ticked off and they engage in very deceptive practices when we stop playing the evidentialist game. So the proof of God is that without him, you could prove nothing. Everything would be meaningless. Now they want to say, ah, uh, we, can, we can find meaning to this. We give it meaning. No, you don't because you, you, you are believing that you are simply the product of the world around you and that the, in the world around you, there is this pervading matter and energy causal principle. Cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect. So matter, energy, causality, and regularity. Okay? All in one, you know, bunch. But the point is, that's their God, and it's impersonal and unconscious. Now, where do you get that from? Is matter and energy the causal principle, the uniformity of nature? Is it eternal? Is it unconditionally absolute? Or did, did something that is absolute and unconditionally non-dependent impose and sustain that? Or is matter, energy, um, uh, causality, and the uniformity of nature as a bunch, is it simply a brute fact? You see, yeah. the a atheists have been getting away far too long in dealing with naive and Christians who are not reasoning bi biblically. And guess what? I'm guilty of that on years gone past. It's because the world's view, which stems from Greek philosophy, is that, you know, the mind of man is autonomous. And so we have to reason toward God just like we reason toward everything else. Well, that's fallacious. It's totally fallacious. Because if we're going to reason about the existence of God like we reason about any other facts, then God is not God. And when I argue for the existence of God along with other Christians on, on Discord, and we appeal to God's revelation, many unbelievers, they laugh and they, and they snicker because they don't believe God has revealed himself. But here's the catch. If I reasoned in any other way, then they could step in and blow me out of the water if they understood the mistake of that reasoning. Well, okay. What do you mean in any other way? Because 
the only way to posit and instantiate that God exists, the only way is that God, when existing and creates this world, has to construct the world in such a way that it reveals him to the everyday man, that creation itself reveals God's existence. Because if God, either God constructed this world to reveal himself, or he didn't construct it in a way to reveal himself. And if he didn't do that, there would not be any way to posit and instantiate God's existence. In other words, what would be ultimate and absolute, even if it did exist, would be unidentifiable and undiscernible. So the only way to know that which is ultimate and absolute is it must be a personal being and it must have a requisite attribute set and it reveals itself. And if it doesn't reveal itself, then it cannot be invoked. I mean, it, somebody could invoke it, but they couldn't invoke and instantiate and defend that it actually exists. And so when an unbeliever rejects the belief in God for whatever their usual reasons are, such as, I don't have a reason to believe in God, they don't get a get-out-of-jail-free card because then they're believing in a world around them that is intelligible and that there are facts in the world. Well, that presupposes that there's something that's fundamental, absolute, that's imposing and securing regularity. So the question is, what's the reason for that? Now, I asked an atheist philosopher this very question. Okay, his name was Massimo Pelugi. He has two earned PhDs, two, okay? And when, he, when I said, why are you an atheist? Because I don't have a reason to believe in God. I said, good, what's your reason to believe in a not God world? You know what his reaction was? He got angry. He goes, well, my reason to believe in a not God world is because I don't have a reason to believe in God. I said, but that's silly. Because if you need a reason, what if I say to you, I don't have a reason to believe in a not God world? Okay. So when the, when the atheist says he disbelieves in God because there's, there's no evidence for God, then what is the evidence for the not God world? That there is something that is imposing regularity and order and intelligibility. What's the evidence for that? So when somebody says, um, there, there's no evidence uh, for God, I say, good. Then what is it then that is ultimate absolute that institutes what's possible and impossible? They go, well, I don't know. Well, if you don't know, how do you know it's not God? And then I point out, um, if you say there's no evidence for God, you would first have to determine there is no God first before you could say that facts don't stand in causal relations to God. So why do they do it? Because they can't defend there is no God. And since they can't defend there is no God, they'll say the next best thing. There is no evidence for God. But you couldn't sustain that unless you first determined there is no God. So whatever perspective we look at atheism and, and unbelief outside of the Christian worldview, it ends in catastrophe. So Christianity is proven conclusively and objectively to the impossibility of any other worldview. And you said that you feel that um, those qualities that you've described are not present in the deities of any other religion. No, the God of the Bible is entirely different than any other God concepts throughout the annals of human history and, and religion. There is no other perfect God, right? Even within Islam, although Muhammad claims his God is perfect, his God is not perfect. His God does not have all great making properties. Now, unbelievers will charge, for example, that, oh, your God allowed this, your God, he's not maximally benevolent. Well, that's, you know, their position, from my point of view, is, is disputable. But we can clearly see all the other gods out there are not ultimate, right? And by ultimate, I don't simply mean supreme. 
to be ultimate means to be eternal, absolute, immutable, unconditionally non-dependent, and the source of everything that is, can be, or cannot, cannot be. In other words, everything that exists must derive and depend upon God. And if there's one thing that coexists along God, then God cannot be ultimate. Okay? If there's one thing that coexists... If there's one thing that were to coexist from eternity with God, then God could not be ultimate. In other words, to be ultimate not only means to be unconditionally non-dependent and the source of all possibility, you have to be sovereign over everything. But if there's something else that coexists from eternity past, he doesn't have control about it, 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 its existence. Now, in your, I guess, um, framework, in your worldview, is is God a part of the universe or separate from the universe? No. It's the creator creature distinction. If I if you're on a chalkboard and I draw a large circle and in the in the middle of it I write God, and then down to the lower right hand corner of that circle I draw a small small circle and I write in creation and I draw an arrow diagonally from the big circle to the small circle, that's the creator creature distinction. God is the only thing metaphysically that is necessary, absolute, eternal, ultimate, sovereign, immutable, and everything else depends and derives from God. Now, I'm not defining God into existence. I'm just simply explaining the creator-creature distinction. Now, that will either be accepted or it will be rejected. And if it is rejected, if it is rejected, it is a de facto denial. Okay? And more importantly, the creator-creature distinction is a worldview. To not accept a worldview is to deny a worldview, that it is false. Because everybody has a worldview, including children. And whatever worldviews we do not accept, we, by default, deny it, even though we say, but I'm not denying it. This is is why it's so absurd when atheists say, but I'm not denying God, I'm just unconvinced. But you see, God is a worldview that's the creator-creature distinction. And if you don't accept that, your model of reality, your worldview, is not the creator-creature distinction. So then you have a different worldview. So that worldview, whether it's clear or fuzzy, is the antithesis and the negation of the creator-creature distinction or worldview. So to read... Go ahead. I I was just going to kind of agree with you. I I think a lot of the um, miscommunication or the trouble communicating about topics like these is that people are working with different definitions of God. A lot of times in conversations. Yeah, that's, a very, that's a very good point you made right there. Because a lot of, see, unbelievers are constantly thinking about God as the Greek philosophers were, okay? They're not conceiving of God as ultimate. They may be conceiving of God as supreme, that he's the biggest, he's the baddest, right? He's the prime mover, but he's not ultimate. Right. And so if we don't conceptualize God, even in a rudimentary way, they okay, think of him as the final boss. Yes. Yes. As, as the, he's the, he's the, he's the fine, final boss. Well, you can you can be indifferent to God uh, exemplified that way. But when God is conceptualized, OK, definitionally as ultimate. You cannot be neutral toward that. A God that is not ultimate, right, you can be neutral toward. And so every single day, every week and month for years, I'm constantly battling against the atheists and the unbelievers, okay? And what they've done is they have erected a castle. But that castle is fatally flawed. It's 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 a piece of cake to take down the castle. 
And, but they love that castle with all their heart. So they decided as a last resort that they do not want the castle that they love to be destroyed. They're going to dig a moat. The, they don't the even castle. want it to be investigated. They don't right. want us to explore the castle. Okay. You remember in Star Wars where the Death Star had a fatal flaw? Yes. Right? And, and yeah. Luke Skywalker had to fly in. And, you know, he was so used to shooting at, you know, these creatures, you know, in his little, whatever, his little space scooter it was, that all he had to do was get into this channel and fire on it like he f fired at one of these creatures. And the problem was he was being fired at by other cannons and other spaceships. Well, the castle has a fate, it, it has a number of fatal flaws, okay? And the atheists have a vague notion that, the castle has several very fat fatal flaws. So in a last ditch effort to preserve the castle from the, its fatal flaw, they have dug a moat all the way around the castle. And that way you can't exploit the fatal flaw to bring the castle down. You first have to transverse the moat and unless you transverse the moat, you can't exploit the fatal flaw of the castle. Well, what is the moat? The moat is the claim of the atheist to be neutral toward God, to simply being unconvinced. 